on two wheels this week. The final instalment of trail riding in Andorra. And it's old versus new. Honda's original Super Blackbird against Suzuki's new Hayabusa. An ultimate sports bike. Never heard of it? That's because it's a class that's never existed until now. This is Suzuki's GSX-1300R Hayabusa. The machine, which Suzuki say is so advanced, it's demanded an entirely new category, Ultimate Sport. 1300 cc's of fuel injection with a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. I'll say that again slowly, a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. Named after a Japanese Falcon, it's taken the title of world's fastest production bike from Honda. This is a machine which really can fly. Also named after a bird is this, the Blackbird. Not the domestic singing source, but the CBR 1100XX Super Blackbird, named after the black stealth bomber designed to creep up on the unsuspecting and wreak havoc. Not quite the same when it comes to a bike, of course. This one's metallic red for a start, very pretty, but not a bomber colour at all. But what you do get is a very good Super Sports Tourer, following a line first established by Kawasaki with the GPZ900R in 84. That did a meagre 150 miles an hour. Then came the 170 mile an hour ZZR11 in 1990, and as if that wasn't enough, along came this in 96, the 180 mile an hour carbureted Blackbird. Carburetors, you say, but the new Blackbird's got fuel injection. Yes, we know that, but there must be thousands of you out there with one of these, a good old carbureted version, and you might be thinking, shall I trade up to an AFI, or shall I flee the nest and go for a Hayabusa? Fleeing the nest? That was clever, wasn't it? Blackbird, Hayat birds, never mind. Here it is, the Hayabusa. It is officially the fastest bike on the planet. We're talking about production bikes, of course. No carburetors on this, 1300 cc's of fuel injection, monstrous power. It's difficult to put into words the kind of sensation you get from just the slightest twist of the throttle, especially in first and second gear, just instant power, fantastic. Now, if bikes sold on performance figures alone, then the Wild and his wife would own one of these. That isn't the case, which brings me to the shape. Very different, not everybody's cup of tea. And personally, having had this for a few weeks now and spent a good deal of time looking at it, and trying to decide whether I like it, I think I do, but it has taken time to grow on me. Certainly wasn't love at first sight. This bike has been designed in a wind tunnel and quite simply, this was found to be the most aerodynamic shape. The intakes for the Ram Air are in a different place to other models, which means there's no room for a headlight. So it's been squashed up and stacked up, high and low beam on top of one another. Interestingly, the high beam is at the bottom and the low beam is at the top. Now, I don't think this shape is a million miles away from the Blackbird, just a bit more extreme. And if this is the most aerodynamic shape, then who knows, in the future, all bikes could look like this. So we'd better get used to it. Well, no way could I ever get used to that shape. Mind you, I could actually get used to this, this little Swiss chalet. All I could do with it is a little Heidi to keep me company. But enough of that. This Blackbird, once called the Blandbird, if you remember when it was introduced, very plain styling, but nevertheless, it's all there, all of a piece. So what have we got under this bodywork and all this rain? You've got an 1137cc motor for a start off. You've got flat slide carburetors. That's quite a mouthful, but that's instead of injectors, of course. Six B gearbox, motor produces 164 brake horsepower. This is a sophisticated bike and 180 miles an hour after all. To keep it all quiet, nice big stainless steel cans here, no problem there. Nice big seat, ideal for two-up touring. It's got silly little bungee hooks at the back, mind you. They're in completely the wrong place, especially the one on the tail grab. Should be wrapped round the, um, or rather down by the indicators there, get a better grip on it, so to speak. Up the front end, you've got that pointed fairing, which came along before the Hayabusa, again with a piggyback headlight. You've got your disc brakes, your six pots, your linked braking on Honda, just like the VFR 800, link braking system, apply the front brake and it brings the outer pistons of the back brake on, apply the back brake, brings the outer pistons of the front brake on. Very clever. Dashboard nice and neat, adjustable levers, nice big adjustable mirrors. All together, a together bike. And so is the Hayabusa. The question I've been asked most often during the past couple of weeks is, does it handle? Well, the simple answer is yes. You've only got to look at the ground down foot pegs and the scuffed lower fairing to see that this bike can be chucked around with the best. 
it's not as sharp or as flickable as your more common Fireblades and GSXRs and the like, but it certainly handles much better than you might expect from a machine with a weight of 215 kilos or 474 pounds. The upside down 43mm front forks are fully adjustable, as is the rear single shock. The brakes are fantastic, no fading, no grabbing, just beautifully progressive. This really is a bike which inspires great confidence despite the enormous amount of power on offer. The Blackbird is a consummate all-rounder. At 223 kilos, it's not in R1 country, but it feels much lighter than the 10 kilos it saves over Kawasaki's ZZR. The steering is light and the suspension compliant. It gives a stable feel to the bike, which is probably why it's so popular with, let's say, the more mature rider. Performance-wise, it's difficult to fault in absolute terms. The latest EFI version has sharpened up response, but open those flat slides and it takes off in an eerie silent whoosh, and before you know it, you're in license losing territory. Swapping over to the Hayabusa is an interesting experience. Forget 200 miles an hour for a minute. This is the real world with cars, trees, cowpacks, and gatsos. 159cc, 9 brake horse, 8 kilos, and a few quid separate these two birds, and that's about all in the real world. All right, I'd say the Hayabusa is a bit more chuckable, and I'd agree that the motor feels a bit more squirtable, but there really isn't that much between them. At the end of the day, it's a very personal choice, and a lot of that is down to looks. For me, the Hayabusa is incredibly ugly. It looks fat and overweight, like the car world's Dutch Viper, whereas the Blackbird looks classy and understated, but some would say boring, like a Honda Accord. So you want the world to know you've got the fastest? Go for the Hayabusa. If you just want to go incredibly fast, the Honda will do nicely. Thank you. It certainly will do nicely, but I do recall many of the comments when this Blackbird was launched. It certainly wasn't an instant hit. Many people thought it looked too boring, too dull and dreary, too understated to be the world's fastest bike. Not that dissimilar to the kind of comments aimed at the Hayabusa. The ride on the Honda isn't that much different to the Suzuki, and I have to say it does feel slightly more sporty and a little more agile. The power difference really doesn't come into it, you can only go so fast, officer. I would say that if you want to blend into the background or perhaps you like the boy racer feel without the image, then this is for you. On the other hand, if you like to turn heads and get noticed, even make people jealous, then really you need to be riding a higher busser. Well, it's not quite the Isle of Man, we didn't make it over there, but this is uh, as close as we can get uh, for the time being. But these two bikes, Jeff, um, fantastic, both of them, you've got to agree. Definitely, no doubt about that. Top of the range stuff, you know, brilliant. But you've got a problem with the higher bus, haven't you, with the shape of the front? I have, it's the dewdrop nose, that light lens at the front, don't like that at all. And I think it does a disservice to the bike because it looks heavier than it is. It looks heavier and bulky, you know, very, well, I kind of agree there. I'll tell you what I do agree. I, I like the front of it. I think it's different and it's, uh, it's unique. And, uh, and, uh, to, Say to, that again. To yeah. a lot of people, that's very important. I think the indicators could have gone in the mirrors as, yeah. as the Honda. That's right, because they did a good job on the Honda, styling much better on that. And yeah. The way they've stuck them there, I mean, those, they look like big hairy nostrils there, don't they, in the front of the... <laughs> You're very cruel, right? Change oh, the subject quickly. Oh, no. on, oh, yes. on paper, both brochures here, Hayabusa Blackbird, uh, not much between them. No, we're doing an, an extract just out of interest. I mean, they're, they're virtually identical, you know, other than the obvious, the top speed thing, but she's 20 mile an hour, Paul, we must forget that. Well, yeah, who's it, it, it going to find out, but anyway. Yeah, and so on the face of it, very similar bikes doing a very, very similar job, and it's just the way they do it, and the way they actually look at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. I think you must agree, though, that the, the higher buster from the back end looks fantastic with that huge 190 section tyre. The biggest tyre you'll get on any production bike, that. Yeah, so, so I understand, and 190, but they wear out just as fast, or if not faster with this. Well, there's a lot of weight and an awful lot of power for it to deal with, and uh, I have heard of them wearing out fairly quick, and at the moment there's only Bridgestone making these tyres for yeah. this bike, so um, supply has been uh, uh, a little bit awkward, yeah, I believe. Yeah, right. so, so they've but, cornered uh, the market, but there'll probably be others along if it's going to sell. That will improve. And it will sell. That will improve. Yeah. Well, I think they're both fantastic, and I think it'd be difficult to split them, but if you want it to look different, you've got to buy a higher busser. Yeah, but if you wanted to be um, a stealth merchant, just like the <laughs> stealth bomber, a bit of, sort of more discreet, you'd probably go for the Honda, wouldn't you? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, two sets of keys here. Choose your weapon.
So which of these two-wheeled rockets really is the best? It's a very tough decision. We both agreed that the Blackbird, although it didn't have the same instant power as the fuel-injecting Hayabusa, did feel much smoother in its power delivery. The Hayabusa had a slightly annoying vibration coming in at 4,600 revs, which translates to 85 miles an hour in top gear. There was none of this with the Honda. Both machines handled superbly well. They're not out-and-out -out sports bikes, but they're as happy on the racetrack as they are tootling through a quiet country village. A quick glance over the spec sheets shows just how little there is between them. The Blackbird claims 164 brake horsepower, while the Hayabusa says 175. The Honda has a 5mm longer wheelbase, and its seat is 5mm higher than the Suzuki. The seating arrangements are slightly different. The Blackbird has a one-piece dual seat, whereas the Hayabusa employs a two-piece unit, with the option of removing the pillion pad and fitting a rear cowling to give it a racing-style look. The Honda weighs in at 223 kilos, and despite possibly looking heavier, the Suzuki undercuts this by 8 kilos, tipping the scales at 215. It's all very, very close. On-the-road prices are just a few pounds apart. The Hayabusa, or the new fuel-injected Blackbird, can be put on the road for less than £8,000. So do you go for the tried and tested Honda Blackbird with its classy looks and a top speed of around 180 miles an hour? Or do you dare to be different and choose the Hayabusa with its unique styling and 200 miles an hour top speed? It's a tough choice. Honda's proven track record or Suzuki's fastest production bike in the world. Either way, you won't be disappointed. And after the break, part two of trail riding in Andorra. Oh, I'm totally knackered. Can you go away? No, I'm not playing now. Go away. Well, how would you react if somebody shoved a TV camera around your bedroom door at seven o'clock in the morning? The sad thing was, I actually felt worse than I looked. Can you believe that? Maybe it was something to do with all the vino collapso that I'd drunk the night before. There was no way I felt like getting on a bike first thing, so I went down to the town for a spot of shopping. Andorra isn't just about trail biking, there's a massive array of road bits and pieces, more accessory shops than I've ever seen in one place. And the great thing is, it's bloody cheap. There must have been about 20 bike shops along the main street alone, every possible accessory you could ever imagine. I asked one of the local managers why there were so many bike shops. Andorra is a tax-free principality and we get bikers from all over the world, for example Australia, for, uh, a lot of riders from England and you can get uh, good accessories here and approximately half price uh, that of the rest of the Europe. Yes, half price the rest of Europe. Half price, I said, can you believe that? Yes, we've all seen the advert. It's worth coming for the accessories alone. You can save a fortune. Well, all spent up and saddle sores much improved, it was time to do what we'd come for, to get back on the bikes and head up into the dusty mountains. The riding was a little bit more laid back today. Everyone was a little bit tired from the previous day and it hadn't rained the night before, which made our progress a little easier. It also gave us the opportunity to enjoy the scenery a little bit more. I actually dared to take my eyes off the road once or twice to admire the spectacular views. And with lunch just around the corner, we headed for a picturesque Pyrenean village. With windy little streets and very funny shaped pavements, you seem to be able to ride anywhere you want when you're in the mountains. It's not just the riding that's hard work on a trip like this, the food takes a fair bit of getting through as well. You get a chance to eat copious amounts and part of the attraction is sampling the local delicacies and seeing beautiful places like this. So a little tip for you, if you're thinking of coming trail riding in Andorra, make sure you leave home on a very empty stomach. Salute. 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 As well as the traditional meals of paella and fuet, we all had to try the local Bino Rocco. That's Spanish plonk to you and me, 
And this is where we all wished we hadn't worn <laughs> our white t shirts. Arms led. Arms led. Come on. Come on. Nobody's done it arms length yet. <laughs> go for it, Paul. Go, go for it. Go, go for it. it. All the way, all the way. I've got, I've got long arms, though. Come on. Yeah. He's in it. <laughs> so, John, how long have you been trail riding around Andorra? Uh, I've been trail riding actually four years, but commercially two years. This right. is my third year. So why Andorra in particular? Um, beautiful scenery, great trails, good food. Yeah. Um, it's just a perfect place. I agree with all of them things up to now. Um, you don't only do it here, where else do you, do you go? Um, in the winter time we go to Morocco for four months. Right. Uh, summertime is here in Andorra in Spain. Right. Five so, months. So what do people get? This is a holiday that you can pay for and book and yeah. come along and get the bike. Yeah. Use of the bike. What else do people get? They get the bike, either a Honda XR 400 or an XR 250. Mm -hmm. They get me, the guide, uh, fuel, food, third-party insurance, and uh, that's about it, really. And the chance to see some gorgeous scenery. Yeah. Um, what sort of people come? The mixed year, is it? Yeah, anybody. We get 80% um, of our clients are road bikers who are trying off-roading for the first time. Right. And we've had Dutch national champions here as well. Yeah. So everybody really, anybody at all. Right, especially now the, the holiday. It comes in various formats. You can have three days, five days. Is it, is it pick what you want? Is it? Yeah, we do anything from one day's biking, you know, two nights accommodation to six days, seven nights. Wow. Yeah. And people will come in and ride every day for six days. Third day we always uh, take it easy, wow. have a big barbecue, drink a lot of wine, and then go go downtown shopping. All oh, right, that sounds yeah. good. So what's the longest someone would come here for? What's, your, what's the record? I've um, got a German book this year for 14 days. <laughs> wow. So. Is he completely mad? Um, he's a pensioner. <laughs> should, Is could he? be, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, he's a much braver man than me. And so, after lunch, we took our bikes up to 9,000 feet. Now, you wouldn't really expect to come to the Pyrenees and not find some snow. And it's not often you get chance to ride your bike through 12 inches of the stuff. And that's not how to do it. The idea is keep the weight on the back, keep the front wheel light, and that's it. Easy as that. Here's John scoring 10 out of 10 for artistic impression. Look at that, wonderful. Everybody did actually fall off at least a couple of times or got stuck. The great thing was nobody got hurt and no bikes got damaged. And contrary to what these pictures would have you believe, I did actually make it across once or twice. Honest. Well, I'm absolutely dog tired. Completely knackered, I think is a better expression. I'm just wondering these things, uh, these huskies, they normally pull sledges. I wonder if they're any good at pulling XR 250s. Mush, mush. He obviously doesn't understand Mancunian. <laughs> Spanish-speaking husky, no doubt. No doubt the huskies could tow your bike back, but what you would need in a real emergency would be a good mechanic. That's not him, that's another husky. This is him. Now, a very, very important man on this uh, in this outfit is John the Mechanic. John, tell us about the bikes, what we're using. All the bikes we use are XR 250 and 400 Hondas. Mm -hmm. um, very simple machine, reliable, economical, and from my point of view, easy to maintain. Uh, exactly, because you are the mechanic. So, um, are these? They're obviously road legal because we go on roads. But are they different to, to how you get them? Do you have to do anything to them? No, they're basically as they come out of the showroom. But apart from the rocky terrain here, we fit sump guards, obviously to protect the sump, mm -hmm. uh, disc protectors, and supply all the protective clothing, just like you're wearing now. The hey. top quality, Dane easy stuff. Uh, you've sold it to me. It's all right. Oh, sold right. It. It's all okay. right. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Right. So, do, are you mechanic? Um, you know, you have to work late hours sometimes, long into mm. the night, putting things back together. Do you have any big smack-ups? Well, we had one yesterday that took a bit to repair when the subframe got bent, but as you can see, the bike's back on the road now. So, yeah. no, it's not really a problem. The bikes are very reliable indeed. And the bikes need to be very reliable. The average day's trail riding in the Pyrenees will last about 10 hours and cover anything from 100 to 200 kilometres. 
And this is the area, believe it or not, where the Knights of the Templar lost the Holy Grail. And after two days in the saddle, I'm just about ready for the Ministry of Silly Walks. Would you like to know how I really felt? Ah, bloody sore, bloody aching. Sore arms, sore shoulders, sore leg. Damp boots from yesterday. But apart from that, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Not this is complaining. <laughs> Not that I want to moan, like. <laughs> Well, after another hard day in the saddle, we're back at the place where we always end up, in the bar. Now, I know what I think of this um, trail riding round Andorra. Let's see what these guys think. Mark, first of all, um, tell me all about it. Well, uh, first day, Paul, we did about 150 kilometres and it was about, out for about 10 hours. That was a long, long day and we, we were fairly sore. We'd all had a few offs, so, you know, sore all over the body. Today, we, we probably did a little bit less than that and the terrain was a little bit easier and we got a bit of fun in the snow. You know, it took a bit longer, so... Yeah, we had a great time. I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. Right. Am I going to get the same reaction off you, Stuart? Oh, yeah. It was great. Really, yeah. really enjoyed it. The scenery is amazing, and there's no way you could top this in England. Uh, it's so difficult to think of where else to go. Right. I'd love to do it again, though. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Got all good stuff so far. Steve, same again, I presume? Yeah, I mean, for 300 quid, which is what we paid for the entire trip, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's been great scenery. Learned a lot about off-road riding. Yeah. I hope they can apply that to my road riding, and uh, tomorrow we're off whitewater rafting to uh, finish the whole trip off. White water rafting? Yeah we, paid, yeah, we paid for that as an extra on the end of the trip, but that'll uh, just be something to round off the whole uh, trip for us. Right, well, I think I'll just sit the white water rafting out. I've got something a little bit more sedate in mind. White water rafting? I don't think so. After the two days riding that I've had up in them mountains and the bumps and bruises that I've got, this is the only white water that I want to see. Now, I hope you've all had your supper, because this next scene is likely to cause some distress. Young children should look away now. Well, at least I'm not quite as white as my bathrobe. But seriously, two days riding in Andorra. Is it worth it? And would I do it again? You bet I would. Next week on Two Wheels, Wayne rides yet another new brand of scooter. This time it's a PGO. And another idea for that biking holiday. Touring in France. <laughs>